Hello, Keelan, Patrick Burke. Hey, how are you? Hello. Hello. I hit record before you even started, so I'm... Wow. Yeah, legally, I have to tell you that. Um, okay. So, I can't believe you fell for this shit again. You're back? I know. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, for once, I'm not talking to myself. It's time to go beyond the book and get over your shelf. So, um, how's that three name thing working out for you? Is that like tied to the it's FBI? Uh, no, it's good. I, I, you know, I used to have seven, so oh. I figure it's just progress at this point. I'm kind of doing the Prince thing, where oh, because it was so unwieldy. Yeah, yeah. It's just you know, I, I think so. When you get down to KPB, are you going to be more uh, like? Uh, excited about the APB connection or the KGB connection like that because well, honestly like... it can be a bit of an exclusive for you right now I mean I wasn't really prepared to announce it but I'm thinking of just going whole hog with just the symbol okay no that's it's, yeah it's gonna be this kind of a you know inspired by the ones that you see on the side of toxic chemicals oh yeah yeah you know don't touch you know you touch this book you are gonna the the half life of this book is going to probably pose a less danger later on down the line, so don't buy it immediately. Well, less about the books and more just about me as a person. True, you know? you're gonna have to get that tattooed and then like oh on my face, right? Because you can't cover that up. Right, people need to know the minute they see you what they're in for or the, not in for. Yeah, yeah. The EPA's gotta gotta know where you're at and be trackable. Um, yeah, EPA for KPB. APB for KPB, who's uh, tied to the KGB. Tell me that's not a campaign slogan right there. I mean, I don't see how it doesn't work for you. I, I mean, don't. like, because you're you're a hustler. You're an artist. You're an author and a designer, <laughs> right? I mean, Elder Lemon Design. Are you designing, like, book, the, the page design and all that? No, no, just the, oh. just the book covers. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, as long as as long as AI will uh, will allow me to stay in business, you, you know, know, that was actually on my list as things to talk about. And as I was writing all this stuff down, I'm like, he's going to be absolutely depressed after we have this conversation because there's like nothing good anymore. There's no well, I good. Mean, that's that's in keeping with prior conversations. I mean, I, I know to expect that coming in. Yeah, yeah, you're you're I, not I just like basically mainline Zoloft before I even connected the call. You know, the maximum is 200 milligrams. A day? Now you tell me. Yeah, the maximum. I, I'm on like twelve hundred right now. So you're getting you're getting your Zoloft mixed up with your calorie intake. So, oh. so a lot of people do that. So right. yeah, I guess you don't have to worry about your caloric intake if you're on twelve hundred milligrams Zoloft a day. That was my thinking. Yeah, I had a banana this morning, and that's probably all it's going to be for the for the rest of the day. At least I think it was a banana. It when you when thing. you key thing here. This is a lot. When you bit into the banana, did you did did some did you hear a scream? Like that's usually an indicator it's not a banana. Well, I don't know because I was screaming too. So oh yeah, yeah. It sometimes cancels it each other out. out. Yeah. 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 So um wow. Uh you know, I, I, I am curious to know how were you able to tease Kin on your personal page? Did Paul like send somebody after that post went up or was he, was, was it a pre-approved because that it kind was. of was like, it oh, was. What? And that was one of the biggest misconceptions. And one of which, you know, <laughs> I, I wasn't aware uh, would be controversial, you know, quotes, but yeah, uh, I spoke to Jason um, yeah. at Suntup uh, who had spoken to Paul about it. And their idea was to, for a first time, just to announce it early, get some buzz going. So, of course, you know, me saying, all right, publisher's wishes, here I go. And the the reaction was interesting. So you, but you didn't say it's coming from Suntup. You said a fine press edition. So you just, you went right up to that line and, and, and you actually had me who, who knew this was coming, um, sort of wondering, is he also going to do a trade edition later on? It like, and that's like the bait and switch, like, oh no, no, I'm doing a trade edition in 2025. But right now, well, the wording of 
those announcements from me was by design. That was all cleared ahead of time and it was by instruction. It was, okay, so how about the first one? You say this and you don't mention the publisher. And on uh -huh. the second one, you do say the title and you don't say the publisher, but don't give away the title of the ancillary material or the new material. Yeah. So I was basically just following my instructions. And I, you know, I've done that a million times before. I did not expect what the hell is this guy doing to be coming? It should be kind of the reaction. So, I you know, that's the problem when you have these people who are, and I'm chief among them, uh, so amped up for a Sun Tup release and the way he games it and the way he gamifies it. Games, it sounds like you're voting in Chicago, but gamifies it where this like release, this tease, this excitement, you're getting emotions high, you're getting hype going. And then inevitably people fill in the blanks with their dream list and they, they, anything less than uh, a, a signed Cormac McCarthy book is going to be like a letdown. Which honestly, I mean, you know, I collect books myself. I've dealt with limited edition collectors since the start of my career. So I get it. Yeah, but I it was honestly wasn't even in my mind that breaking the traditional format in this regard was going to piss anybody off. <laughs> Otherwise, I might have come back and said, "Well, wait a minute, isn't this going to piss people off?" But yeah, yeah. It is, and I mean, the only hope now is that you know, I mean, I can I can sincerely apologize that it is not a sign Cormac McCarthy or any of those books. <laughs> but the, my only hope is that the people who take a chance on it actually enjoy it. You know, that's oh. all you can think at this. Point. I mean. So you're yeah you you're gonna get the people that are like author and artist in one. It's got to be Clyde Barker, Keelan Patrick Burke. Um, there are a few other authors. Chad Lutsky's among them, but there's no history there with Suntop. But there are there are a few, so that narrows the list. Mm -hmm. Um, but there were those that are like I I don't know if you went to the cemetery dance forum, but there were those on there that were like, oh my god, if this is kin with a prequel novella i'm gonna probably sell my cemetery dance edition and and i'm definitely gonna get this one because it's gonna have a, a little more to it than um but i will say when i first learned about cemetery dance uh it was with it when they did their 25th anniversary edition yeah and i went on their website i'm like well what else are these goobers doing and i saw this and i read the synopsis i'm like this sounds badass. And I don't know. I just waited on it and then I it sold out. And and um I I always regret it. And then someone was kind enough to gift me a copy and I read it and I'm like, this this is awesome. This is great. I knew I was jibing, vibing with this book when I saw it on there, and, and it really lived up. It exceeded the description, I think, because when I read it. I guess we're in kin now. Um, when I read it, I I just the premise sounds it sounds more exploit exploitative. Ex, yeah. It sounds more like just a gore slap. When you say Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you're like, okay, this is a movie that pushed the boundaries of what people would accept in cinema, and yeah. they did that for a reason. Tobe Hooper, you know, it was all very much for the shock and awe of it. And so when you get that association, you don't really get this idea of what this main character is going through. And it's been some time since I read it, which I'm happy for, because when this comes out, I'm going to read it anew. I'm going to read that. So it's going to be all very fresh. Um, <clears throat> but you don't get the isolation and that, that vibe of that main character and the depth of his story. And uh, there's so much more to it, thankfully. Like, I, I, I just love that. Ple being pleasantly surprised by a book instead of just thrown into a melee of body parts <laughs> right yeah into the into the meat factory but it's uh yeah it was a, a kind of a, a balancing act i mean that the whole idea came from loving those movies like texas chainsaw massacre deliverance all that so i grew up watching that stuff but uh yeah it, it kept coming back to me how how much we celebrate the final girl getting away and I thought, well, what, what is that life going to be like? Right, right. You know, I mean, what, what happens next to her? She's not going to go home and go, <laughs> dodge the bullet there, I guess. Anyway, back to work. 
yeah i just thought no we need to see what happens next and also it was a way to study the radial effect of grief you know especially with loss on that kind of a scale and it's just it's not one person touched by it and the victims are kind of they're dead and they're forgotten in some of these movies oh no they died but we're still rooting for the final girl what about the families of those people yeah. you know what about yeah. the connect emotional connections the friendships and it just the more i thought about it the more it started expanding outward but in order to pay homage to it too i thought it was important that the lethality of these absolute bonkers fucking cult people right it needed to be shown and demonstrated too but also it was vital that they not be one dimensional you know that they have some kind of heft and weight to them that there's a For reason sure. they're not just you know hey you know it'd be fun let's massacre some people there's got to be a reason and there's got to be a reason that they fervently believe in because i think that that makes them scarier i've always yeah. found that villains that have a belief system that justifies their actions are infinitely scarier than just guy goes nuts and goes ape shit you know you need that you need to see uh both sides of the equation um and without without the lethality of it and and there is there are plenty of scenes in the book that are that are fun i mean like it is it, it is shocking it's gross it's like it's like uh it's a full pyrotechnics explosion at a concert fun. <clears throat> and that's awesome because when you, when you go the other way and you go too academic with studying these things, you end up with a book like the collector, which I thought was brilliant. John Fox. I loved it. Yeah. 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 Brilliant book. Brilliant. And I appreciated it for everything it was, but it's very academic and it's very, very deep and thought provoking, which is, is a different part of the brain. It tickles than you know, something else. Um, but it can be, it can be uh, polarizing. Like, well, yeah. I mean, you you can show it and not necessarily bog it down with analysis either. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it, it needs to be kinetic at the same time. There needs to be some motion. And a guy standing around sitting there thinking for twenty eight pages is not motion. Right, know? right, right. And, yeah. and I think you know, I think people do like that. Look into like, what what is that? brain like because i haven't read zombie yet by joyce carol oates but <clears throat> i'm looking forward to it because we do like it it is fascinating to get into that mindset of of somebody who's motivated by things that just seem like to be honest i've been to ireland i call it violence island um because i saw so many fist fights there in my my one week there and i'm south side irish chicago born and raised so like we're not really doing it proud the the, no. the the motherland um different textbooks in school that's why oh yeah oh yeah for sure but uh i'm somebody who's never even really beaten somebody's ass like i've never read, been in a fight i i just don't go there i'm not like that you know and yeah and so these people who do these things is so alien to me and uh, it's it's interesting to get into that human zoo and look, take a peek in there. Um, well, yeah, and in addition to that, you know, the other side of the of the exploration is how far good people can be pushed before they become a shadow of the monsters themselves. Right. Because I mean, you have innocence at the beginning of it. You have these people who are just going about their business, get attacked, get murdered, all sorts of stuff. And that was it to me, too, is that the soul survivor, she's just going to, even if she gets extensive therapy, whatever, how is she ever going to sleep again knowing these people are still out there? Yeah. And how? what steps would you take to erase that trauma? You know? I mean, it never truly goes away, but no. it's infinitely worse to know that these offenders are still roaming around somewhere. So that fascinated me, too, is where is that line? Yeah, We can all be good and we can all read books about the kinds of horrible things people do, knowing, secure in the knowledge that we would never be those people. Right. But how far do we have to be pushed before it just seems like the natural response? Yeah. Yeah. No, they, I mean, ultimately, you, 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 you like, and they, they've done studies on rats. We see what happens when you cage things and and they run out of bat they run out of space they run out of resources they run out of patience they run out of whatever buffer existed before they finally turn to that sort of um survival animal instinct but 
Um, how did the prequel come along? Did did Paul watch our interview last time and go, I want that novella? Like, what was that? What, did you pitch it or did they just I did, yeah. out of you? I actually, I did. I pitched it. Um, I started writing it and and I just, I absolutely fell in love. It felt like the absolutely right thing to write in this universe. And yeah. I loved it. It features some of my favorite characters that I've ever created, one in particular. That I just want to, I, I want 10 novels with this guy. Oh man, it's, uh, I love hearing that. Oh, he's, I absolutely lived and breathed him for a while. Um, but yeah, and I, I was confident enough in where I was to pitch the idea of a kin edition with a brand new novella. And Jason called me and he was, yes, yeah, let's discuss this. And his uh, his enthusiasm for it just increased my own. Oh, that's great. But yeah, and we set a deadline. And unfortunately, in one way, I guess, like when it comes to inspiration, unfortunately, in the middle of it, my dad passed away. Oh, my God. So I had to take a couple of weeks and just, you know, deal with that. But what I wrote when I came back to it is kind of informed by that, you know. Wow. It, it is very much a, a story about fathers and substitute fathers and children and yeah it wasn't easy to write it it, it became this free-flowing love fest and then that happened and then it became something else entirely wow <clears throat> but as a result it remains i think one of my favorite stories i've written far and away and last summer i actually went to um tennessee where the book is set the great smoky mountains and uh, to do research and i started it then you know i just wrote a couple of pages but the flavor of the whole place everything about it was it was an amazing experience i'm not someone who goes hey i'm gonna set a story in hawaii i better go there <laughs> you know yeah this just seemed to make sense to me because i was researching a lot about evangelism and um economic the economic desperation that leads people to believe any huckster who comes through town during the great depression so, yeah, that's where I set it. And it is about all manner of terrible characters convening, coming together with an innocent child at the epicenter of it. Wow. And the impact of spiritualism and, and religion and crime, everything. I just threw everything at it. And I love it. I love this story. I recently actually reread it for the first time in weeks, months even. And, yeah, that's what I'm real proud of. How, how long is it? It is just shy of... Now, I know people get all turned up on this. It's not a short novella. If it was about 10 pages longer, it would be a short novel. Wow. You know, it would qualify as a novel. Um, but yeah. And I cut, some, I cut some stuff from it because of the aforementioned adoration for my own character. I just wanted to see everything he got up to. So I found myself prattling on and putting him in all sorts of situations. <laughs> when I read back on it, I went, oh, that's a little bit masturbatory. Let's pull that out. <laughs> so I think it actually would have come in. It would have come in longer and would definitely be novel territory if I'd left that in. But as much as I loved it, it felt extraneous. Um, so, you, so you're not Stephen King then? So that's how you're not Stephen King because... No, no, no. He gets it I, in there. I, I'm pretty ruthless when it comes to self-editing. If there's a description of a table lamp that I think is lovely, I'd be like, yeah, I think it's lovely. But that is seriously just going, hey, look at this <laughs> lamp. Instead of instead of the yeah. moment of stalls because you're in love with your own voice for a minute and you need to cut that shit out. That is hard to do. I don't know how you can do that. Because... Is, I'll tell you, it's a lot better now than it used to be. I look back on oh. some stories I've written, which oddly enough got a lot of praise at the time. Um, about the floridity of the language, lyrical, melancholy prose. And I'm like, wow, I was so encouraged by that at the time. And now I read it and I'm like, get to the fucking point. Keep wow. Get to the, why is that tree described for seven pages? Wow. That tree better fucking do something or, or we're <laughs> cutting it down. Yeah, yeah, that tree better turn into a book of spells or something. Like yeah. uh, some, some lumberjack chops it down and makes a books out of it. And wow. the thing is, I can see it. I can see like I'm I'm still proud of the writing that's there. I'm like, well, oh, I'm sure. Really poetic, but in terms of a story that goes somewhere, 
cut that shit out. You're not trying to, you know, talk to your high school English teacher. For fuck's sake, cut it, you know? Usually an editor will wrestle that out of you. Um, so that's why I'm like uh, in, in awe of your ability to do that yourself, to recognize that you're you're now just serving the yourself instead of the story. Um, well, I'll tell you what was a very educational experience for me in that regard. Is I, I was asked, hired to write a screenplay um, about two years ago now, I suppose. And I turned it in and they loved it. But they had notes, as they always will. And one of them was, this is beautiful writing, but you're not writing a novel. Wow. All we need is what you're going to see on the screen. Yeah. There's there's room for a flourish here and there, you know, stylistic choices, but it's entirely visual. So me describing a guy walking across the university quad that takes a page because I'm describing the trees and the, the burnished afternoon light. And they're like, this is beautiful. Cut that shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so a whole different. I went back. I wrote Cottonmouth after that. And I think I was even more ruthless than I used to be. Because yeah, you, have, I... you have all the room that you want in a book to tell a story and to show off if you want. But if it's not serving the story, no matter how lovely it might be, it needs to come out. So screenwriting and comic book writing were two things that taught me the economy of language. To just not waste time showing people how lovely your writing is. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's pointless. You you have to you have to have a good visual partner um, and and have faith that they're going to convey that emotion, that sort of beauty that. And I I, I have read screenplays where there are some things. I actually got I just bought the the screenplay uh for Hellraiser 4 written by Peter Atkins and yeah. I was flipping through it and and there's some stuff in there and I was even thinking this kind of seems extraneous like it's not stage direction um right. it's not something an actor is going to work with as far as like says nervously okay I get that as an actor I'm supposed to feel something here um it was little I thought a little self-indulgent, but you know, um... but I'll tell you that is, I think that's pretty common from someone coming to writing screenplays after writing novels. Oh, I'm you sure get, you get so spoiled with having a, an infinite canvas when you're writing books that, and I mean, when, when I look back on the first drafts of those screenplays now, I'm like, it's nice, but <laughs> it doesn't belong there. And when you're trying to work within a restrained time frame, you have 90 minutes. That's all this movie can be. Don't fill it up with descriptions of fucking flower pots, you know? <laughs> so was it your story you were adapting or was it someone else's story? I actually can't say. Oh, okay. So, um, Well, I can tell you something. I can give you a bit of a scoop. But in reference to this screenplay, this was no work for hire. Uh, hopefully, it's, it's coming along. Hopefully, we'll have some news about that by the end of the year. But based on the back of that, I did actually get hired to write the Sour Candy screenplay. Oh, wow. Which I turned in a couple of weeks ago, and the response so far has been really good. Now, we haven't gotten into the guts of it yet, but initial impression is positive. So, hopefully. But I also uh, have become well aware of how rare it is for these things to work. You know? Yeah, I was on your Wikipedia page again. Uh, I did. That's my entirety of my preparation. Does this person have a Wikipedia page? Nope. We're going in naked. That's it. We're flying in. No parachute. Just jump. Um, and I saw that Peekers was uh, optioned or I don't know. I'm not. I'm not Hollywood shit. No. But, but that Mike Flanagan was going to do it in 2013. And I was like, yeah. what? And that. that never yeah, it was a big deal. And it was also a very educational experience for me because. Every time I see another author announcing that a book of theirs has been optioned, I'm like, don't say it. Don't say don't it. Don't talk. Yeah. Because way back then when that happened, I was like, Mike Flanagan, Lionsgate. Yeah. Right? We're involved. The deal was done. I went out and got a giant bottle of champagne, came back, had half of it, and then told the whole fucking planet it was going to happen. <laughs> I was in my head buying houses. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. it all felt fucking landed like a wet fart about a year later. And you just, now I don't tell anyone anything. Now I just, whether, it, if it happens, that's fantastic, but I'm going to believe it won't till I'm sitting right. in the movie theater eating popcorn. Yeah. Until you, until you're disappointed by what they've done to your, your work. Yes. 
you, yes. you, you're just going to wallow in it like Paul Tremblay with uh, Knock at the Cabin. And then you're going to walk around with a shirt that said the book was better. He did that. I'm like, did all right. That? Well, fair play to him because honestly, uh, the book is fantastic. I was less enamored with the film. I was too. But here's the trick with that is the trick I tell all my viewers on this channel. Lower your expectations. No, no, lower. Like just like a barroom mat. And um, uh, and that way you're going to be happy because you're going to be so, um, you're going to be expecting a disaster. And that's how I went into watching that um, movie. And I love the book. I love the ambiguity. I love the the way it ended. And um, I did not want a position to be taken. And then he had to take, and he took one. I'm like, all right. And I allowed it. And I'm like, okay, for what it was, if you had to go one or two directions, it's kind of interesting. But well, it struck not, me the same as as Cujo, the adaptation. You know, I don't, I don't remember that movie. Uh, King doesn't remember that book either. But I don't remember the movie no. as well. It's but weird I, how much I love that book. I I always like many people dismissed it for years, going killer dog. Okay, whatever. But I ended up reading it late in life. I wrote an essay actually for Sermon Dance. It's on their website about Cujo revisited. And I was kind of blown away by it. It is. It's an amazing book. It really it's is. It's more like a deconstruction of marriage that just has this dog as an exterior force. And yeah. But there, again, when it comes to all the endings, they just go, no, 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 no. Audiences aren't going to like that. Which I think is this perpetual problem that we're constantly assuming audiences can't handle shit. When yeah. we obviously can. Oh, But I thought, oh. I thought, thought the same about that. Yeah, it was a respectable ending, but Paul's was... That was a punch in the dick. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. so much better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, and, and that's the thing. I, I expect that sort of garbage thinking from Hollywood. I expect Hollywood to go in and make a business decision instead of an art decision because they got, they're extending, they're extending millions and millions into these products, these mm -hmm. films. Nervous. They get they're going to be nervous. And they're going to do Which that. Which makes sense. And also, these people who green light or red light movies will probably be out of a job if that movie right. doesn't do well. So right. I get it. And also, I think that test audiences are an absolute friggin' nightmare because you have 50 people in a room making a decision about how this movie should play. Right. You you, know, you're going to, yeah, yeah. But it is. And it's one thing I have learned, and William Goldman said it, it it's... A miracle anything happens, any movie gets made because nobody out there knows what they're fucking doing. No one. No. Well, no. what 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 disheartens me is that I see that same thinking coming into publishing, and yeah. you you got especially, and I don't know if it's because of the dawn of social media, but you got all these publishers that are like, you better build your platform before we even think about getting your book out because you have to bring the audience now too. Yeah, like, it's it's not like an editor discovers an author and then introduces them to the world and there's your audience. They're like, no, you need to come here with your audience and don't bitch about the book cover because you're going to get what you're going to get. And yeah. we may or may not support you in marketing because that's your job now, too, apparently. I talked to an agent once. Um, he had read, uh, I can't remember, maybe Sour Candy, but he'd read it anyway, loved it. So let's get on the phone. This is a pretty big agent at the time. And I was like, oh, excellent. Got on the phone. First question out of his mouth. What's your social media reach? Oh. And I'm like, well, did you like the fucking book or didn't you? <laughs> you know? And if you did, can we talk about representation? And then maybe down the road a bit, worry about what my social media reach is. Right. And I, I unfortunately talked to him right after deleting half my social media. <laughs> <So> oh. <laughs> But that is me. I do. I always come at everything at the wrong time. I'm a late adapter. And then once yeah. I get familiar with it, I blow it up. Yeah. But the thing is, if you've missed out on TikTok, then you Chinese, the Chinese government doesn't have your info. So oh, you they can't... have all my info. I get, yeah, I sent probably... it to them at the beginning just to get that out of the way. Oh, it's always, it's a nice thing. It's that their amnesty program is real nice. It's a, before right. our tanks roll in. If you mm -hmm. send us your stuff, we <laughs> might give you a square of land. But at least, you know, if you're not on TikTok, you're perfectly, perfectly safe on oh, all yeah. social media. That's so, you know, you can Currently, be secure in the knowledge that nobody else is watching you. 
currently that's yeah that's the only danger that i'm aware of is tiktok mm-hmm. oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah so uh sour candy um uh, okay i gotta admit when i when i was reading guests and i'm, I'm still i'm not done with blanky yet but i read guests sour candy jack and jill and the dogs are dying and I, I will say i didn't get sour candy that's just a story about a guy becoming a dad i mean that's right yeah it's a pretty i'm like all these other stories are horror stories and creepy and there's some element to it, but this is just a guy who became a dad. Yeah, it's nonfiction. Right. I, that's what I'm like, okay. I'm trying right. to shake things up a bit and just said, well, anyway, enough of the horror. Let's talk about the joy of parenthood. Yeah. Okay. Because, yeah, I mean. Who, the response like, yeah. has been strange, though. I mean, people just seem to consider it a horror story for some reason, which I think is kind of insulting. Wow. Huh. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I just took it that the people with the horns were like just deer. You know, I don't know. I mean, because here's emotions. the thing. They're, they're parental emotion. That's all they are. They're just representations of, you know, how yeah. much you can suck sometimes. It was beautiful. And, um, you know, it's yeah. Um, and then Jack and Jill was disturbing because my wife's name is Jill. And I think she wants to do that. So I don't know if you're like. A prophet ahead, ahead of things. Um, they're all just warnings, man. That's it. To me personally, like I'm basically Nostradamus with a fucking weird accent. That's it. So, were you upset or were you happy that on April eighth, uh, the world was replaced? Everybody in the world was replaced by grinning idiots during the solar eclipse because that's the thing about peakers. And I didn't know if you were like, oh, yeah, this is it wasn't the grinning idiots are here. Were you like afraid? No, um, they weren't all grinning either is a problem. So <laughs> they're harder to tell, you know, and it's even harder to detect on social media. But I know that there's, there's an awful lot of them who got left behind, which is just a disgrace. It was. Um, I love that, though. I was out watching it. But what was amazing was I was out watching and I made a whole day of it. Um, and I looked around and I can see all my neighbors and nobody was outside oh nobody everyone now maybe they took a trip somewhere to see it somewhere else but i kind of doubt it um there was construction workers all up there like that doing their thing it was pretty cool but no it was just eerily quiet which kind of added to the effect of it because we got i think 99.6 totality here really yeah when that happened this absolute sudden twilight was yeah creepy i loved it yeah it was uh, oh, so... i was happy everyone else was like Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> i'm taking notes everybody's coming back from the store with ammo and bottled water and toilet paper yeah and did you raid anyone's houses while they're like oh well they're all out i'm the only one around no i can't say that on a oh on a... yeah oh yeah, duh, yeah. Duh, but duh. email me later and I'll... okay yeah. so this is your previous sun tough book i like how you put the introductions to the stories ahead of the stories like i'm going to be a doofus and fall for that and read your introduction before i actually read the story it's a nice try but i just said oh these are all afterwards Mm -hmm. um but i did like that i do like that element of uh i'll try and always do that because i mean the books i read by horror authors growing up uh, short story collections i would love that yeah and i think i think for me when i was first messing around with writing, trying to get a handle on it, trying to find my voice, reading where other people got their ideas or what inspired them or how they handled the conversion from inspiration to text worked for them. It was as good as having a teacher at the top of the class saying, this is what you need to do. This is how I did it. But I used to love that. So I, I do the same. And the feedback on that has been amazing over the years. Yeah. People just seem to really love, okay, but where did that fucked up thing come from? You know? It, it, it... It it is surprising because what what I realize when I read those things is that the the impetus the the seed isn't necessarily what it's going to look like at the end of it all. And it and can I, you intend it to be? You can right. sit down with a set idea, and by the time you're done, it can look nothing like it. Right. It bends in a different direction, and mm-hmm. it's wow. I mean, and and the theme I'm getting from the, from the stuff I've read from you, so Kin um uh guests uh i lived I, I read some of we lived inside your eyes somebody close to to me said um uh the house on abigail lane is your best novella ever so i've got to get to that i haven't 
I haven't read it, but there's a theme that comes. And, oh, and distinguishing features. What the hell? What the hell was that? Um, yeah, that's a weird. I've thought about that one in a long time. That is, it's wild. But there's a theme that I get, and I don't know if this is or what where it comes from. But isolation, like when I read your stuff, it does feel like no matter how surrounded the main character is with people and and what's going on there's this sense of total isolation like it 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 more so and then anyone else's work where i i feel like that is that common vein of dread that runs through it like this person's been cut off from the herd set for destruction and there's nothing to be done about it it's actually very insightful i've never thought of it that way but, but i mean yeah that's and I, yeah and it could it could very well be that that's that's what it is because i'm one of those people like i see pictures on social media of somebody celebrating their birthday and there's like 70 people there and i'm like i don't even fucking know 70 people i know yeah i don't know seven <laughs> my birth my birthday party is just me looking miserable crying into a pint well it so, flavors it it could be yeah, it could be what what that is is that even if i'm in a crowd of people i never feel part of it i never have and it's not a hostility. Wow. I don't go in and give off vibes where people go, Ooh, what the fuck? People, if anything, people always try to bring me into these things and I, I act accordingly, but it all feels like like I'm on stage just playing a role. Wow. You know? What is that? Because you're, you're that, I think that is why when I read your stuff, I, I connect with it so, so profoundly because that is exactly, and, and I, I wanted to do at the end of this interview an Irish goodbye. So we don't have to do the bullshit. Cool. You just hang up, you know, like. Yeah, nice. We're this done. Was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, But yeah, I think, I think that, that really, and, and so you've always, you've always felt that way. You've always felt that sort of like distance. I've always at any time in my life had one good friend, one best friend. I've never had two no. at the same time. It's always for six years, maybe this is my best friend in, in, in grade school or whatever in high school, it's somebody else for that duration. After that, it's somebody else. And then somebody else is somebody else. I've never been able to, it was funny because I decided to do something for St. Patrick's day once and then realized I didn't have enough people to invite. Wow. So I just, I invited a couple of people and relatives and shit. And I was like, okay, this is fun. And we had a great time, but yeah, I'm not somebody I can, I can go to a convention and talk to every single person there and have a great time. But I'm always aware I'm somebody who's being there representing something mm -hmm. that I'm not, you know, I, I don't know. And it's not that I'm I'm an introvert. I always claim that I am, but I'm I'm really not. I could talk to anybody. But yeah, do I but, want to? <laughs> but there, well, first of all, I gotta ask, when you get, when you move on from friend to friend, is it like because the body starts smelling and then you have to get a new friend? Like when you it's trade when up. I know too many of my secrets and need to Oh, dealt with. oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I realize that's, that. Um, yeah. that that's interesting. Uh, I I had another point, but then you know I realized I was worried about my own mortality and all of a sudden, and that kind of knocks your your thoughts out. Yeah, I think you know stuff. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I gotta I gotta drink that away. The thing with you know with sour candy and Jack and Jill is that that's super strong, like especially in sour candy. Yeah. No, that's that is kind of a recurring theme. All right, it's. Because I think to under to endure those kinds of challenges, whether they be metaphorical or not, requires you sitting alone with them. Mm -hmm. Plus, it increases the helplessness if you know that there's nobody you can talk to about it. Oh. It could just as well be a metaphor for mental illness. You know, they, people keep telling you, you're going to be fine on social media. You're like, who the fuck are you, though? Wow. Yeah. You know, right. thank you. I appreciate where you're coming from. But oh, yeah. Only I'm in here. That is like the most terrifying thing I think anybody could say to me. Like that right there, that sentence. Only yeah. I am in here. I'm gonna, I'm just going to schedule the panic attacks for tonight. Might as well. So I can work around them. So I can be like, all right, well, here it is. And then eat some kibble or something with the dog. Right. 7.15 p.m. Smash head through window. <laughs> 8.15. 9. Watch Fallout. Do you plan on like when you write... A lot of your stuff is novella length. Is that intentional mm -hmm. or is that just, that's where the story went? 
It's where they go. I mean, people have said it that the amount of times that I hear, I wish it was longer, which is a fantastic thing because you want that, you know? Sure. It's better than I wish, you know, I thought the fucking thing had never end and it's like nine pages. <laughs> so I do, uh, <clears throat> I do whatever the story, you know, I'll, I'll write it and it ends where it ends, you know? I don't like, like we said earlier, I don't like padding it out to a acceptable length. I mean, there's books I've I've written that I now think could have been better served by being a little bit longer, and some that definitely could have been shorter. So I just I I go with how the the story feels as I'm writing it, because if I start to feel like well I could go a bit longer on this one, that's a conscious effort to protract it rather than yeah. get the story down and get the fuck out of there. So yeah, I do love the novella length. I I think it's the perfect length for a story. I do too. It's just deceptive. I mean, the story is always bigger than the page count because there's there's more to explore. And you know, obviously, once you get into it, you're 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 thinking about things and you're you're contemplating things, and then it echoes after you're done with the book. You put it down. It it reverberates, like anything worth your time should. There there are some authors who who like act like they are still in college and have to meet some sort of page count requirement arbitrarily set by a Napoleonic um, professor. Yeah. Um, Cause I've seen some real, real generous margins on some with big type pages and uh, that, that stuff just doesn't bode well. It is a better, it is an easier reading experience and you feel like Mr. Academic. I just went through a hundred page book in 10 minutes because it was like four pages. I do kind of like, and maybe it's something to do with uh, with getting older, but I do actually like when the line spacing is bigger. Because then I feel like, this book, I don't know, a week. <laughs> or back when I was back when I was in my teens, I would read the, like, the stand in seven days. I just wouldn't do anything else. I well, you didn't have to. Yeah. Get up, read, right. go to sleep, read. You know, I just, that was it. And I ate that stuff up. Now I'm like... Too big. Oh my God. Yeah. So who do you read now? Jesus, everyone. Um, I find it hard to keep up with with some of the, the new folks coming out with stuff. And I, I got the Libby app, the library app, specifically so that when I'm browsing social media and see somebody announce a book, I can put in a hold on it. But the problem is, I think I've been so busy that I, I might have read for pleasure maybe 14 books last year. Wow which is about the lowest I think of ever, ever. I used to, yeah. I, I used to know less than 50 books a year. Anyway, wow. now it's, it's going down and down. And plus I get a lot of people asking me to read their books for blurbs for the cover. Sure. Which I love to do, but also if you're doing all that, you're one looking for time to write and read. Yeah. So I've gotten to that horrible position. I never imagined where I have to start saying no. And that sucks. You know, even though people, yeah. plenty of people said no to me back in the day, but a lot of people didn't. So, and then it's, you know, well, Mr. Big Shot author won't say nice things about my book. And it has nothing to do with that at all about, well, I'll say yes, and then I won't have the time to do it. And then I look worse. You should just get like a Mad Lib thing that generates blurbs where you could just be like, because I've seen so many of the same types of blurbs. I couldn't put it down. It's heart stopping terror. You know, this this sat with me long after I turned the final page. I mean, there are all these things you could put out there. Yeah, but then you run the danger of somebody reading the book and going, hmm, starting to notice this Keelan Patrick Burke saying a lot of nice things about a lot of these not-so-great books. Well, then, see, that's another way you're different than Stephen King. I well, think... they say that a lot about – that's a good example because they say that a lot about his stuff, you know, and, and I don't know because I don't know him personally if it's a case of – his agent or his publisher saying, hey, this book could use right. a boost. You want to say something nice? And whether he reads them or not. So, yeah. but honestly, I don't, I think he's beyond caring what, what a couple of fucking people on social media say anyway. Oh, he's, he's you know? earned his uh, cruise control setting at this point. I he, think so, yeah. But I don't yeah. like to do that. I, 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 I kind of insist on reading everything. Oh, so, yeah. But the problem is time. I, I think currently I have 15 books that people have sent me to give quotes for uh two of them i actually managed to read over the last two weeks and they were really good so that's i love when that happens yeah i hate, I hate when it's somebody i really like and they've sent me a book they're really proud of and i'm reading it going yeah 
Just... That's when I'm suddenly too busy because I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not saying mean shit about somebody's book. I'm just not. Oh no 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 no. There's for enough sure. people out there doing that who love tearing other authors down. I I get no no enjoyment out of that at all. It's it's better just to hand it back and just be. I'm never going to get to this. That's that's what I said. And the thing right. is that 90 percent of the time that is the truth. Yeah. So you know. How 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 far in a book do you go? And this isn't just necessarily for blurbs or whatever. Before you're like, okay, this is a did not finish, trash heap book for whatever reason. It could be just stylistic. It could be not my favorite content. But how long will you give a book before you move on? Um, there was a time when I was very proud of the fact that I had never not finished yeah. a book that I started reading. I was like, I don't care. I'm in this for the end even if ultimately i put it down afterwards i was like well that was a stinger yeah. but now i would say probably 50 100 pages maybe yeah i i like to give a book chance to build up steam but sometimes i can just tell from the writing that no matter what happens it's not going to be done elegantly or effectively enough and, and like i said i get to read so little anymore that i can't i just can't yeah i want to support you buddy but fuck you know, can't do it. Can't do it. You know, there's so many books that um, I've read where I, I'm I'm like rooting for them, and oh yeah, it's like if you only had a good friend or or an editor or somebody who said pull back on this part or change this around, and you could get the motor revved and you could get to a place people want to go and go with you. Um, and it's a shame. I hate when that happens too. Yeah. And especially in your position where it's a professional obligation uh, or courtesy. Yeah. And I so, love, but the, but the upside of that though, is sometimes you uncover some really freaking fantastic stuff. You know, uh, AI Jang, uh, her novella Ling Hun, she sent that to me, I think last year at some point. And it was a novella. And to be honest, I'd never even heard of her before. And she said, would you mind... Uh, reading and if you like it give me some words and I'm like okay and I'm always nervous if I haven't heard of the person before because to me in my head rightly or wrongly it increases the chance that it won't be fantastic and my god it was it yeah. was yeah it was something else and once I read a book like that I'll never shut up about it that's the thing yeah yeah anyone asked anyone asked me in conversation real life or online hey what's a good book that I could read them that go read it go away <laughs> yeah no no and it's it because and i think that's the the flip side of that is that's why a bad book pisses me off so much because you do I get want to rave about it yeah right yeah and, i do i want to get real excited and i want to keep talking about it 10 years down the line i'll still be talking about that book when people rec ask me for recommendations i will always mention it so if it sucks for any reason or worse it's actually good but i know people aren't going to like it for fucking reasons of their own i'll be like uh shit how but, did you um what what comic book did you write when you talked about that earlier i, I didn't i didn't know you you worked with comics i did the graphic novel of sour candy for um, oh okay yeah and i've been okay. doing uh short stories for their tales for halloween night annual series as well i just turned in one uh two days ago but yeah and it's it's pretty similar to screenwriting only in the shorter you know it's dialogue. Yeah, right. A lot right. of dialogue, a lot of telling the artists what's represented in these panels. And you got to yeah. be succinct as well. So, yeah, that and screenwriting all, all basically just taught me how to cut the shit. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> AI is going to replace you. You're going to be even more isolated than you currently are because the bots are just going to take in. They're not, they're not going to give one shit about any of us. No. So um, what else is in the works for you? Beyond this moment, do you have a, do you have a, like, are you somebody who has like 50 unpublished books sitting on a hard drive somewhere that you're like, they're a moment away from tweaking to perfection? Or do you have like nothing and you're just like, I need to start building some houses? No, I'm uh, currently revising uh, a new novel that I've been working on for seven years. My output is almost as slow as my reading. Oh uh, boy. I have approximately probably a lot more now but last time i looked at it a million words of unpublished stuff in a what i call the unfinished folder some of them are just a page some are 
50 some are 200 pages but it's all wow. in there yeah and sometimes i'll go back in and i'll look around and i'll I'll see something and read and go ooh, and it triggers something and i'm off to the races so i i'm very protective of it because I, it's not junk to me it's no things that i start in just for whatever reason whatever headspace i was in or i hit a wall and i'll go back years later and go oh shit that was pretty good let's see where this goes you know and there you have it but i also um yeah, I've just turned into Sour Candy Screenplay. Uh, there's a bunch of short stories I owe to various editors uh, and probably a new novel to start this year. So, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I'm never not doing something. Who Who's the new novel coming out with? Is it self-published? Nobody yet. No, it's um, right now what I'm doing is going over my agent's notes for it. Uh, and then it'll go back to her and she'll try and sell it for me. So, yeah, we'll see. How did you start all of this circus anyway? What was your first, when you wrote what, like what, what was your first published thing? Jesus. Uh, my first published thing, I was 18, happened on my 18th birthday. Wow. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a short story for an Irish magazine called Writings. And I thought I was king shit of fuck mountain after that, I got to tell you. <laughs> Until I realized later that they don't even read them. They just publish them. So, <laughs> oh man that took me down a few pegs a couple uh, yeah little yeah yeah it taught me a bit of humility um and then <laughs> i think i was 23 maybe 24 when i wrote the turtle boy and that took off you know when the stoker and people seem to just connect with it uh and yeah it's been that ever since i just kept at it so I'm gonna go read the Turtle Boy. I've never read any. I know that it's a series, right? There's like mm -hmm. four novellas or three. There are uh, four novellas and a novel. Um, wow, I, I was asleep at the wheel on that. So I'm gonna read them and I'm gonna black out all your self indulgent stuff. Oh Jesus! Then there'll be nothing left. <laughs> I might as well just send you the covers. <laughs> And who was that with uh, Cemetery Dance, Turtle Boy? That was with a different publisher oh, oh. each time. It was Necessary Evil Press for the first one. Oh, yeah. It was Cemetery Dance for the second. It was Bloodletting, I think, for Vessels. Cemetery Dance for the fourth again. And then, I think I have it here. I do. God, that's terrible. Oh, and Thunderstorm books for the last one. I never realized you had anything with Thunderstorm. They're great uh, they people. Did, they did another collection of mine as well, the novellas. Huh. Yeah. I've been around, man. You you have. That just yep. blows my mind. Yeah, I'm a cheap date. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to Ken. I, I'm, I, done. I, I'm beyond thrilled that, that Sun's Up are doing an edition of this. I mean, honestly, you ask me any books that that I would like to see done to be given that treatment, and it's it's Ken. And the, the, the thought that there's new material for people to read has me just giddy i can't wait for people to read it well like i said on our, our last conversation you mentioned that um the the prequel and i'm like here for it i i pretty much recently read kin at that point and loved the idea loved it and 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 knowing how the book how, how kin went and how that was a very satisfying thought-provoking read more than i expected and there are times you jump into a book you're like i don't want to think you know, I just want to have fun. I want to read something that's uh, shocking. And um, so I'm not disparaging like any authors out there who do that. There's a place for thrillers. Oh, yeah. Fun. It's like a Kesha song. You're not going to really think about it too much. You're just going to be like, OK, uh, I had a good time while she was here and, and now she's gone and I can't follow her anymore. But oh, and I'm the same. I read literally everything. You know, it, from pot boilers to airplane or airport reads to, you know, beach reads and then literary stuff, plays, fucking westerns, I'll, everything. I'll read everything. And I, and I think there's a place for all of it. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I'm not in the mood to be reading literary classics. My brain doesn't want to work that hard. Oh, my God. No, I don't want to be I don't want to be hitting it on my kid going, what the fuck does that word mean? <laughs> Great. Now I feel stupid. Thanks very much, Cormac McCarthy. So yeah, you know, you gotta wonder why some people so I give Cormac McCarthy a pass. Me too. Whatever, but there are other people who think they that's how they get access to Cormac McCarthy's pedestal by putting in words that nobody uses and, and acting like that's the thing. But 
it's not the thing. I think the thing is if you can make a story that says something and can communicate that clearly and powerfully, you don't need to rely on the the weird kitchen utensil to get you there. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a big difference. There's books like, and I mean, my business is words. I I absolutely get a thrill when I encounter a word I don't know. I love it. <laughs> there, are, there are times because I do, and I'll write it down and go, Jesus, that's an awesome word. But there are times where I'm just not in the mood to work. No, I just want to read this this fucking this fast paced whatever hundred page novella. Just just give it to me, you know. And there are other days where I'm like, I'm feeling rather grand. <laughs> well, you got your pipe. Yes, and... my pipe, my smoking jacket. And go, all right. right, good evening, sir. Thrill and... me, if you must. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a thrill. We're at an hour. Um, Jesus, that flew. My court-ordered hour. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, they said, uh, really, if I talk to somebody more than an hour, I'm overstimulated, and then, therefore, I go out into the public, and that is an issue um this is a zoom meeting this is visitation it kind of is Jeez, kind like of... A, don't tell me that ahead of time <laughs> um so i i'm just i'm beyond stoked i thought you were in big trouble with uh paul when you revealed it i'm like what the what did he do everybody what? did and it was amazing how fast they all went well this guy's a dick and i'm not going <laughs> i mean yeah that's true but not in this regard i didn't do anything <laughs> You don't know about the other stuff. This wasn't yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I'm all right being friggin' shot with your arrows, but at least, you know, use the right quiver. Right, right. You're going to get your contributor copies, and then you're going to sell them for that um, pipe tobacco money. Yeah, smoking jacket repair. Oh, yeah, because you fall asleep with that pipe. Well, as I keep ho hooking my thumbs into my pockets and ripping them. Oh, right. Well, I have, I have to do the walk. You got to get them reinforced. Yes. Yeah, because that yeah, bread ain't the, cheap. I think I'm getting to that part in Blanky where the guy's sewing, uh, sewing some eyes on stuff. I don't know. Uh, he's sewing the buttonholes, and I'm I, I started there, and I'm gonna get back to it, and I'm like, holy shit, man! I mean, I'll tell you, Jack and Jill, that 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 was brutal, man. I'm telling you. So like, <clears throat> for me, whenever when anybody talks about saving Private Ryan. You know, they talk about the U-boats coming in and how they guys got all shot up. They talk about the battlefield scenes where the guy's lifting a leg up and they're, oh, I'm, I'm all bloody. The worst part of that movie to me is when the German soldier is on that guy and he's pushing yes. the knife down. He's like, no, wait, 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 no, no, wait. Yeah. And they're very quietly. That is the most barbaric murder in the whole movie. It's so intimate. It's so personal. It's intense. I can't it, watch it. I can't watch that scene again. I, I well, I we had recently, exactly the same reaction when I watched it. I could handle heads and limbs exploding. Right. The inexorable process of that, and the, the like you said, the intimacy of it really fucking bothered me. They're making eye contact, and he's pleading with him, and, mm -hmm. and it's like this is going to happen. Oh, so with Jack and Jill, I think there's that one scene in it that struck me very in a very similar way the the whole inevitability of it i i think i told some people that uh i go keelan patrick burke is my favorite author when i'm reading keelan patrick burke like this is this is stuff i connect with on um a different level it's like i get it and it it feels very like comforting and terrifying that someone else sort of has that same, those same paths they walk in their brain and the same terrors and same sensibilities. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that's why, you know, I mean, well, there could be a million reasons. I don't know. I, if I was privy to readers thoughts, I'd be a bestseller, but I think a lot of people feel the opposite that they can't connect to it because I think whether without knowing I'm doing it, I, I have very little interest in writing to a commercial degree where everyone no. can pick up and go, yay, I write the way I feel it. And some people connect to it and rave about it. Other people go, I don't know, just. Yeah. No. And I, and I completely understand that, you know? Yeah. And you, you, when you said, if I could read the reader's minds, I'd be a best-selling author. It's true. Yeah, it would be. 
but you want to be a very good one. And cause you got to read your character's thoughts. That's the thoughts you got to care about. And those yeah. are the thoughts. That's why I don't write. That's the thoughts. But those are the, the sense of, those are the people you need to be thinking about when you're writing a story. And yeah, exactly. And if you try and please everyone, you're pleasing no one. Yep. That's yeah. So that's why I try to please no one. Cause then I'll please everyone. You're really good. At it. It. Really it's good. How, at it. That's how I go about it. Just have an office and on the glass have it written, pleasing no one since 1976 or whatever. You know? Yeah, no, for sure. And they're like, duh, yeah, it's, uh, you Thanks didn't have to waste obvious. somebody's job to put that on your door. Right. Yeah. Don't even have a door. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do the Irish goodbye thing. Should I do one of these really bad high school acting jobs and be like, on Jeff, where the hell did you go? <laughs> Jeff? Jeff? Damn.